I'm going to talk this afternoon about knowledge and wisdom, how we know what we know, how far we can trust what we think we know. The Buddha, in his teachings, was always practical. He very rarely got into any sort of metaphysics or any kind of philosophical areas outside the pressing question of suffering and the end of suffering. This is what he was chiefly concerned with. He even uh, admonished his disciples to avoid speculating about such questions as the ultimate origin of the universe or whether the universe is endless or bounded and so forth. This very practical approach, and we'll we'll get back to that, but I'll say that this admonition of the Buddha has, in uh, later centuries, not stopped Buddhist thinkers and philosophers from spinning all kinds of metaphysics and, and theories. You know? Even though the Buddha, as I already noted, he, he said that um, he admonished his disciples not to speculate about whether the universe was endless or uh, infinite or finite. And even in one place, even made that statement a bit stronger, saying, uh, he who takes a position in such things is, is not following the path of Dhamma. Nevertheless, Buddha Gosa, the great commentator who lived about a thousand years later, had definitively said that the universe is endless. And that's been a, a kind of a general general idea of Buddhists ever since. Uh, the Buddha also uh, cautioned many times in many ways against attachment to views. Uh, this is related to the idea of knowledge. Once we think we know something, we become attached to, to it as a view. And this can be a cause of a lot of suffering, both for oneself and others. You see... Uh, it's easy to think of examples in the world of people clashing over opposing views, uh, uh, views and opinions. So how do we uh, come to any kind of sure knowledge or wisdom? There are two words in Pali, as, as in English. We have knowledge and wisdom, and Pali is vidya and panya. Vidya is knowledge of all kinds, it can be, um, you know, practical knowledge. It's useful. Like if you know something about auto mechanics, you can fix your car. You know, this is a kind of knowledge. There's more speculative knowledge, like knowledge of how the the solar system works and knowledge of physics and so on. And there's uh, the highest knowledges are the uh, knowledges of the Buddha at the far end of the spectrum. The Buddha's own awakening was described in one way as the arising of the three knowledges during the three watches of the night. And on one level, this is uh, one of the cases where the Buddha is playing with words taken from the older tradition because Vidya is the same root as Veda, the, the, the Vedas, which were the ancient Indian scriptures that were the uh, in the culture at the time, they were considered the most ancient and, and venerable and um, authoritative scriptures, the three Vedas. And uh, Buddha replaced these with the three Vidyas. In the first watch of the night, the Buddha uh, attained to a recollection of all his past births, going back many hundreds of thousands of world ages, knowing at that time I had such and such a name, I belonged to such and such a clan, such were my pleasures, such was my pain. When I passed from there, I re-arose in this place, and I had such and such a name, and so forth. In the second watch of the night, he attained to the knowledge of the workings of the laws of Kama. 
and he saw how beings rise and fall according to their deeds. And in the third watch of the night, just before dawn, in one place it says, just as the planet Venus was breaking the horizon, the, uh, the Buddha attained to the knowledge uh, of the extinction of the Asawas, the Asawas being the, the root defilements. So his being was perfect. He knew that his being was completely purified. So this three knowledges, there's a number of things that could be said about it. One is that it's a movement of the mind from the personal to the general to the uh, transcendental beginning with a complete understanding of his own being by seeing all his previous births and it's like a a complete understanding of his own personal karma and history and and uh, the phenomena that um, occurred in this continuum then the second watch of the night, that particular case is extrapolated to a universal principle. And he sees how, how it's all a weave of, of kama. And finally, uh, he transcends all of that and realizes the unconditioned. And the being is completely purified. There's no more uh, becoming. So this is a, a complete, as complete a knowledge of conditioned becoming of samsara as as is possible. This exhausted the knowledge of samsaric becoming, and seeing in the the particularly in the second watch of the night, seeing the general principle of kama penetrates to the idea of causality of cause and effect, which is a cornerstone of, of uh, Buddhist thought, that everything in the conditioned existence arises according to causes and conditions, not otherwise. There is no arbitrariness or no randomness. So he sees the pattern in things. So this is the ultimate possible kind of knowledge and the three knowledges of the Buddha Ordinary uh, persons uh, have various levels of knowledge, different kinds of knowledge. And uh, some of the later Buddhist philosophers spoke about different sources of knowledge. For example, I'm not sure if I can recall them all, but a, a hearsay, inference, uh, direct experience, and direct knowledge. Yeah. I'd say at least those four kinds. Uh, knowledge by hearsay is you you know something because you've heard it, someone's told you, you know, so it's um it's the shakiest kind of knowledge. It's just based on what you've heard of what you read. Yeah. It might be true, it might be completely accurate, but also might be misleading. Knowledge by inference is when you don't have a direct knowledge of something but you can infer it. And the example given is uh, if you're traveling and you see smoke rising over a hill, you you think someone's lighting a fire behind the hill. You know there's fire there. That's a knowledge by inference. And that that also can be mistaken. You, you're, you're basing it on a second hand from some other experience and making an extrapolation. And knowledge by direct perception is when you actually see the fire, you know there's fire there. But perception is also a tricky thing, and we can talk about that too, but this is also a possibility of being mistaken. And knowledge by direct realization is things that you realize directly with the mind. You know, it's about, about um, uh, meditative experience particularly. And even this can be misinterpreted or mistaken. One has to be careful. So it's very difficult uh, to find uh, sure knowledge. Yeah. And the important 
thing is not to be attached to views. Right? From the various sources of knowledge, we acquire views. We have opinions and ideas, and, and becoming attached to them is dangerous. It becomes a, a, a stumbling block and a cause of difficulty. It's important to understand that the Buddha didn't say that we shouldn't have views, but that we should hold them lightly, should not be attached to them. He said that even this teaching of mind, if it's held dogmatically, it can uh, cause uh, uh, be a cause of quarreling and strife. Uh, anyone who has investigated um, Buddhist discussion boards on the internet knows that you know this is this is the, definitely the case. There's, there's, there can easily be quarreling, and and this is not a new thing either. Uh, the, the Katawatu is a, a text of probably about uh, six, seven hundred years after the Buddha that records disputes between different schools of of uh, Buddhism and sort of a debating manual. Right? So we don't want to hold on to the teachings dogmatically. I've quoted in these talks before the um, story in the Diginakaya, which is addressed to the question of holding on to views of the two men traveling and they find some straw and they pick up the straw and make bundles on their head and carry on. Later on they find cloth and the one man throws his straw away and bundles up the cloth and says, this is better than the straw. And the other one says, well, I've carried the straw a long way. I've put some effort into it. I'm going to hang on to it. So be it, friend. And as they keep going, they keep finding better stuff. You know, then it's firewood sticks, then it's it's um, pottery, then it's like bars of copper, then of silver, then of gold, and then of jewels. And, and each time that the fellow with the straw, he now he's gone further and further with the straw. He's more and more attached to it. He's more and more loath to give it up. And the other guy just keeps tossing it away. You know, he tosses the silver away without a thought to pick up the gold. And then they come back to the village. The one guy has some straw to feed his, his goats, and the other the other guy's got a, bags of of uh, precious jewels, and he lives like a raja for the rest of his life. And the uh, the interesting thing of the story is that the Buddha didn't praise coming back to the village empty-headed. He didn't say, "Oh, don't you know, don't pick up even the straw. You just don't have any views," which is sometimes how people seem to take it. If you don't have any views, you're you're basically just a simpleton. You can't you can't operate and it can't do anything, make any decisions. But the idea is to hold them lightly, like a working hypothesis. This is how I understand things to be the best of my knowledge and understanding now. If I learn something new, I might change. This is the way uh, the way to hold views. Because any view is based on knowledge, which is ultimately unreliable. Now, to go back to the, the sources of knowledge, if knowledge by inference, what you've heard, you know, you can be quite, you can feel quite certain about some things, but you've no, you no real reason. If if someone asks you why do you, you feel certain about that, you you can't really give an answer. So you. Many people would know, for example, that uh, Alpha Centauri is the closest star to the, the sun. And it's something like you know, five light years away. But if you were pressed, how do you know it's five light years away? You know, it, probably most people that even th that knew that first bit of knowledge, they would be at a loss to explain how it's calculated. But they take it, they've read it in a book, They've learned it in school, and it sounds, you know, they sort of trust that guys that know about that stuff, they worked it out, and it must be true. You know? Life is too short. We can't learn everything. So, you know, so we have to take a great deal of knowledge on by inference. But always remember that, um, you know, it's not 100% reliable. This is just uh, another working hypothesis. 
or unless knowledge by hearsay, I should say. The knowledge by inference is when we have, we're using our reasoning powers to determine something based on, on limited information. And we can easily be mistaken. We can make make all kinds of mistakes um, uh, in in our our reasoning is not uh, not a hundred percent reliable by a long shot. I have to be particularly careful here in that in practice we can see it in if you're honest with yourself, you can see that very often you you decide something on a purely emotive level and then come up with reasons after to justify it. And then uh, if you're not honest with yourself, you'll say, well, I reasoned it out and that's how I determined it. You know? uh, uh, reason is kind of like a like an attorney for hire that can prove either side of the case. Right? You, know, you, you bring in the, the reasons to justify what you want. Sense perception, knowledge derived from sense perception is particularly tricky because we feel quite certain, we, you know, we, if we see it with our own eyes, hear it with our own ears, and, you know, that's uh, very convincing. But it's easy to show how the senses can be fooled. You know, we can have all kinds of illusions. And these happen at different levels. There's the illusions that, that are based on the workings of the, the organs of sense themselves and all kinds of optical illusions that are fun to play with. You, know, you see them printed or on the internet. There's kind of optical illusions that uh, trick you based on the mechanics of how the eye works. They can trick you into seeing something that's not there. And the same sort of thing applies to all the senses. A good example are those um, uh, pictures that are made of little dots, and when you kind of cross your eyes, you see a three-dimensional image pop out. You know, it's kind of just working on the mechanics of how the eyes work. Right? When I was a junior monk, one of those books, it was a book of these images, and it was something fairly knew at the time, none of us had seen it before, showed up at Wapananashat, and it was a Japanese book, you know, it was just all, any text was printed in Japanese, and and uh, this went the rounds, everybody was looking at it, and Ajahn Pasano gave a really good Dhamma talk based on these, uh, based on the, this principle, it's like the Dhamma, it looks like, you know, we first come and this looks like confusing, and then suddenly it pops out. <laughs> Someone, someone else, because it was, because this book was a, was Japanese, somebody came up with the kind of the joke that, well, this is a, a plot by the Japanese to take over the world by making everybody else cross-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> so the, you know, the senses can be fooled, but beyond the uh, mechanics of the sense organs, there's the faculty of perception, which is very important to understand you know, if, to get any kind of grasp on what is um, what is true, what is real, is to understand how perception plays into the picture. It's important to avoid falling into what's called naive realism, to assume because I've seen it, I've touched it, I've smelled it, I've heard it, it's real. Is to understand that the mind is only experiencing whatever reality might be, is only experienced as filtered through the sense organs and the perception. And perception is a mental faculty of organizing, analyzing, recognizing the sense impressions, making sense of the world. The world we actually experience, the world we actually live in, is not anywhere out there. It's a construction of our own mind based on signals coming from the outer world and we make a simulation of it in our mind and we live in that and perception works as a practical way of negotiating the universe to make sense of, of the the world for us as organisms to to deal with reality so it's not a completely real completely true image 
of reality, but it's a functional, practical approximation, something that works. And if we want to see that you know, perception is unreliable, you can think of many ways in which perception is fooled. But the, a very common one is, is if uh, something that probably everybody's done as a, uh, as a youngster is you know, lying down outside and looking at the clouds and relaxing and seeing all kinds of pictures and images in the clouds. This is the faculty of perception becoming playful and creative and, and you know and these images and pictures can be quite detailed and realistic right? so you can also do it with fire right you see a, like a campfire uh, the mind can see images and faces and things this is perception just becoming a bit loose a little bit looser disengaged from the input signals and becoming creative when we dream at night, perception is free, and it's just making stuff up, right? And it's not based on external signals. And this is the perception. We create the world that we actually live in based on perception. And perception colors things in subtle ways. You know, we can feel things to be pleasant or unpleasant based on perception. And that can turn and change. A good example of that is tastes. They talk about acquired tastes. Like almost no children like sour and bitter tastes. Right? But adults come to appreciate the food and drink that has these more exotic flavors. You know, people enjoy like sour taste of, of buttermilk or something like that. It's, uh, whereas very few children first tasting it would like it but many adults like it because it's an, it's an acquired taste. The taste hasn't changed, but the perception has. It's subtly shifted. It's now perceived as something delicious, and before it was perceived as awful. Right? Same thing happens with sight and sound. You know, your perception and appreciation of music changes, and visual scenes and, you know, can be perceived by different people as ugly or beautiful. So perception has a is a very fluid, you know. So knowledge acquired from sense impression can be misleading in all these ways. Knowledge of the direct experience with the mind is the, is an important one, uh, which also we have to be very careful with. There are, are many ways, you know, many things that we experience only solely in the mind. And there's always a danger of misapprehending, of um, not understanding. For example, meditators who think they've reached one or the other of the stages of awakening, and, um, when they actually haven't, because there's many kind of flashy things that can happen in meditation, and a person can misinterpret that. You know, there's... And, their stories going right back to the, um, at least to the commentarial period of people being mistaken. And one modern example that's kind of funny is uh, one of Ajahn Mahabua's books. He tells the story of the whistling arahant. He said that there were four monks. This is a, he was relating a story from his own experience as some monks that he knew. There were four monks that uh, uh, went off to practice together in, in some remote place. And they were staying in uh, kudis far apart in the hills and the jungle from each other to get maximum seclusion. But in case of danger, like tigers or they were bit by a snake or something, they, they, all, they had a whistle. And they could blow their whistle if they were in trouble and the other monks could, would come and, and help them. And after they'd been there a couple of weeks, they heard the, one of the monks whistling and they all, the other three ran up to his kuti. And when they got there, he said, I, I, uh, there's no, no problem. But, um, I just wanted to call you all together to tell you that I have attained to the, to the state of Arahant. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, all, they could all kind of went away knowing not what to make of it. You know? And then a week later, the whistle blows again. You know? And then they go back to his cootie and says that they didn't hurry as much this time. <laughs> And they got to his cootie and he said, I just wanted to tell you, uh, you, 
uh, venerable ones that I, uh, the last time, uh, what I said, I was mistaken. <laughs> what the traditional advice for um, a student who thinks he's attained to one of the stages is to examine his mind and not just once and not just casually, but again and again, looking for the uh, defilements that are supposed to be eradicated by that stage of awakening. For example, with the stream entry, the three uh, fetters that are broken are um, personality view, Sakaya Ditti, right and ritual clinging, Silabata Paramasa, and um, doubt, yeah, skeptical doubt. Uh, thank you. If and um, so that first of all means, and this is where like practical knowledge comes in, understanding what those terms mean, properly understanding, and then examining the mind again and again and seeing if there shouldn't be any trace of those fetters remaining. For our hand is all defilements are eradicated. Right? So there's another story is somebody in Ajahn Chah's monastery, there was a monk who thought he was an arahant and he was kind of walking around all puffed up that he, that he was he, he was the enlightened one and Ajahn Chah I guess got tired of it and he told some some other monk to go up behind him and kick him in the bum as hard as you can <laughs> so then he turns around all angry and what are you doing with <laughs> ah <laughs> There's also a kind of parallel case and very interesting in a philosophical way is the um, in the Brahmajala Sutta the uh, the explanation of how which is the Brahmajala Sutta is the Sutta of wrong views it, it lists all the different kind of wrong views and explains how they arise in the mind the explanation of how uh, the eternalist view like how a theistic religion arises in the world. At the beginning of a world age, a Brahma arises in an empty Brahma palace, and he's all alone for long aeons of time, and he wishes there were other beings. And other beings arise by the force of their own kama in his presence as junior Brahmas in that realm, and he thinks that he has created them by his will because of his wish. And uh, he teaches them that, and they believe it. And then when one of them uh, dies from that realm and is reborn human and becomes a yogi and meditates, and he has memories arise of his life in the Brahma world, but he perceives those as being visions of God. And then he goes forth and teaches about God because he's, he's seen the Creator God, and the Creator God was telling him how he created the world. Uh, this is a, an experience this fellow had. A yog, the yogi had a genuine experience of remembering a past birth and misinterpreted it as being a vision of the present and then developed a whole religion around it. So one has to be very careful with things that arise solely in the mind. You know, they might be very powerful, as this case, but... Uh, Interpreted wrongly, they can lead to very wrong conclusions. What it comes down to in uh, in the end, all you can be really sure of in the moment is simply an object arising to the mind and mind knowing the object. Right. That's the building block upon which everything is based. This, this is the our whole experience there's a uh, an object arising and mind knowing the object and when we're practicing uh, insight meditation vipassana we're trying to get down to that bedrock of experience one of the hardest things to do is to is to peel away all the layers of inference and analysis and the judgmental uh, 
comparison and uh, discrimination and all the rest of it and get down to the immediate experience. Uh, this is a mental object. This is sensation of pleasure. This is a, uh, an image in the mind. This is a, a sound. And be with that as it is uh, in its own nature at that moment. And that's a moment of, if you can experience it that directly, that is a moment of real knowledge, of direct knowledge. And that's all you can really know, is that the mind knowing an object. And everything beyond that is inference and, and uh, uh, extrapolation. And then by doing that, we penetrate the real nature of things. And we get down to the kind of bedrock level of what is real. And what's real at this moment is the mind taking an object. And then in the next moment, that's no longer real. That's gone. The mind is now taking another object. And trying to get to that, down to that really fundamental bedrock level of reality you know, is to work. And then you can begin to penetrate the nature of things and then wisdom can arise, the panya, real understanding the knowledge and vision of things as they actually are. Taking away all the layers, getting beneath all the layers that we pile onto things and getting down to what's fundamentally basic. And that's, that's the route that the mind has to take to become free, to become liberated. It has to penetrate that basic reality.